All right, so what are some of the most common questions we've been getting at Tracebook? That's what I wanna cover with you today. And by the end of this video, I hope that you'll feel more confident about taking measurements for Tracebook and for yourself. So before we dive into this, a uh, couple of things. Everything that I'm gonna to cover today is in the measurement procedure and the getting started video series. So I'll put links to both of those below this video. And I wanna give a big shout out and thank you to everyone who's been uploading measurements to Tracebook already. I think we have 65 approved and we have something like 650 people who have joined the community. So thank you everyone for all of your hard work and your interest in supporting the project. And I wanna give a special personal thank you to Hui Yu Huang in Taiwan, who's been doing a lot of work with me to diligently try to solve some of these issues we've been getting into. Okay. Um, input calibration. You do not have to calibrate your inputs. We realize that not everyone has the required hardware to do that. But if you do, a few things that I've seen go wrong. Um, fresh battery in the microphone calibrator. So if your battery is starting to die in your microphone calibrator, like I discovered mine was yesterday, then you may be losing a little bit of level. Um, and I discovered that I hadn't replaced mine in two or three years. I got it out, I put it on my battery tester, I saw that it was low. It didn't say replace yet, it just said low. But um, after I replaced the battery, I gained 1.5 dB. So uh, you sh if you wanna know exactly how to do that for your microphone caliber, you should probably contact the manufacturer. But all we can say here at Tracebook is that if you want to know for sure, then just make sure you have a fresh battery in your microphone calibrator. Okay, please use all of our recommended settings when you are doing your input calibration. Um, we have a special video all, just all about calibrating the inputs and it's covered in the measurement procedure. So unless you know what you're doing, please just use our numbers and that'll just make everything easier for troubleshooting as well. Why are people not using these numbers? There are some good reasons. Uh, so people have gotten into this, and what we just what I've discovered is that one of the main reasons that people are not using our numbers is that they think it's too loud. So in this input calibration video, you see that I set the signal generator to minus 12 dBFS here, and that's going to output a sine tone. And so then you're thinking, wow, minus 12, that's really hot. I'm not going to put that into my speaker. That's true. So I never actually do that because if you go on and you watch the other videos, you can see here that I've turned down my signal generator to negative 27. So you only need to use all of these negative 12 numbers when you're doing the input calibration. After that, you can adjust your signal generator level from within your audio analyzer all day long and you will not mess up the calibration, okay? We're creating a unity relationship here between outputs and inputs, and then once that's done, then you can still change the audio analyzer uh, signal generator level. Uh, another way that people have slightly messed this up is by adjusting the outputs of their audio interface to be slightly different, and again, that messes up the unity level here. So you'll see in this video, that I am adjusting the inputs of my inter audio interface differently. I'm going to turn on my signal generator here and I'm going to adjust both my reference loop and my microphone calibrator input to both be negative 12 dBFS. And we like use, if you're using smart, as we've seen a lot of people are, um, we obviously Tracebook is not picky. We support any audio analyzer, but if you're using smart, um, then I recommend that you use the input meters within SMART just because it's a known quantity and we kind of know how they work and it's easy to see this negative 12 level here. Okay, so I've set both of those. So output negative 12, input negative 12, and now you can just leave everything in your audio interface alone and change the level from within your audio analyzer. A common situation is that people are sending two copies out, right? If you're not using a Y cable, you're sending out two copies and you're sending one of those copies directly back into the input of your audio interface and you're sending one of those copies out to the speaker or amp or DSP. We need those to be the same. 
If you are adjusting one of those, then you're effectively adjusting the sensitivity of your whole system setup. Uh, we did run into one seemingly uncommon situation where maybe uh, you have matched output levels, but your input level is too hot. You can't get it down to that minus 12 dBFS number that we're looking for. Um, in that case, hopefully you can adjust the output sensitivity of your audio interface. So in, in this specific one time that this happened, it was an RME audio interface and it was set to the highest output level. And so that was too hot for the input to get it down to negative 12. So all this person had to do was adjust the output sensitivity for the entire audio interface so that they could get it down to that level. That was the solution. Um, if you have another situation, I, I'm not going to talk about it more because I think this is never going to come up again, um, but please feel free to email me, Nathan at tracebook.org. Okay. Uh, and then we talked about how after you have everything calibrated, then you can adjust your signal generator output level from within your audio analyzer. Okay. Please document all user-definable settings. Um, the big idea with Tracebook is that anyone in the world, any other audio engineer, should be able to recreate your results. So if I have the same speaker, um, the same setup, whatever it is, I should be able to do what you did and get the same results. So for me to be able to do that, I need to know everything about your setup. Now, what I have run into is that people are making custom adjustments with their amplifiers. And that's fine. You can set up your system however you want. If your system is overpowered and you feel like you need to turn down the amp for better signal noise ratio, that's up to you. That's your preference. But you need to document that because then if I'm trying to recreate your results, then I'll need to make the same adjustment on my amplifier. Now, for most systems, we recommend that you use whatever the manufacturer default is. So if you look at uh, an L Acoustics upload on Tracebook, for example, you'll see that many times the amplifier level is not documented. And that's because we assume that if you uh, follow their procedure and you just load the preset and you don't do anything, then we will have the same results. But if you have some sort of custom setup where you have combined, you know, an amplifier that you picked out with a passive speaker that you picked out and you're adjusting things, you need to document all of that. Okay. Um, so I guess I should have actually called this bullet point high frequency response. So we have found some people that seem like they have some weird things happening in the high frequency response. And if that happens to you, then what we recommend is that you put your speaker up on a stand or up on a, a table or something and just measure the high frequency response close in before any of the reflections or room gets involved. Just measure it, you know, like one meter, put your mic up on a stand. And we're not really worried about anything in the low end of the response, but we just want to see what that high frequency response when you are perfectly on axis, perfectly aimed, then put your speaker back on the ground and try to match that. So you'll try to adjust the vertical aim and match that high frequency response. So what has commonly happened is someone makes an upload and we see that their high frequency response looks unnatural. It curves down or the coherence drops really low in the high end. And then we look at the spec sheet and it looks like the high frequency response should be flat or it shouldn't, you know, slope down that quickly. And so then we have questions. To save yourself some time and confusion, I recommend that you do some of these things ahead of time. Otherwise, you're going to upload your measurement and then we're going to have questions for you. But if you, but there are some things you can do. So number one, if the manufacturer has a GLL file that you can download, then import that into your audio analyzer. That's something you can use to compare. Um, if they have a spec sheet, just look at the picture of the response that, that they say that this product should have. That's something you use to compare. And now we have several things uploaded to the Tracebook already. So for example, we have several QSE speakers. So if you're measuring a QSE speaker, go to Tracebook, download someone else's response. Now you also have something to compare. Okay, let me know if that wasn't clear and you have any questions about that. And then just a application note, if you're using Smart and you're exporting your file from there, you're gonna export uh, an ASCII and then convert that to a CSV, please disable 
the coherence blinking and smoothing. You'll see in these videos that I even forgot to do that uh, in this video. You'll know if your data has problems if you export it and then you're scanning through the file and you see some asterisks because if you have coherence blinking enabled, then what Smart does is it hides that data and when you export it, it actually replaces it with an asterisk, okay? So just disable that stuff before you export it, please. Okay, um, was there something I didn't cover? Is there anything that's unclear? Please let me know by commenting on this video and thank you for your time.